Mr. Chairman. Uh, so my pleasure to present uh, something which may be a bit new in the field of P, uh, about airway closure, although nothing is really new. Uh, these are my conflict of interest. And uh, this is the research letter we published a few weeks ago in the Blue Journal. As you see, um, the title we choose is Airway Closure in ARDS, an underestimated and misinterpreted phenomenon, uh, because we think this uh, was present in front of us since many years, and that uh, we missed it uh, for most of the time. So, uh, we have been interested, and, and I'm, I include myself in this uh, misinterpretation. Uh, for many years we have been interested by the mechanics of the respiratory system in patients with ARDS, and uh, one way to study mechanics is to do pressure volume curves with a very low flow inflation, so you get the elastic pressure, you get rid of the resistive pressure, and by plotting the elastic pressure against the volume, uh, the slope gives you the compliance and gives you the possibility to explore changes in the slope, uh, which for instance have been called low inflection point or upper inflection point. Uh, you may see here a red curve, which is simply to indicate what is the compliance of the ventilator circuit. So of course if you put pressure in tubings, you will compress gas and this uh, is the compliance of this tubing which of course is much much lower than the compliance of the respiratory system. Measuring a series of patients, and now we have 50 patients, this is the data on the first 30 patients, uh, we found some uh, intriguing results and this is a patient where you see the technique of the low flow PV curve so from top to bottom, you have the flow, you have the airway pressure. This would be a classical and expiratory and, and inspiratory occlusion. Then the esophageal pressure and then the transpulmonary pressure calculated classically as airway minus esophageal pressure. And you see the low flow inflation, so very, very low flow, uh, to get again rid of the resistive pressure. But what's surprising is that the first part of the low flow inflation, which was obtained here after a long expiration, to be sure we don't have uh, intrinsic PIP in the circuit, uh, is characterized by an initial abrupt increase in the pressure. So when you plot the PV curve, what you see is this, which is uh, something looking like a lower inflection point, but very, very pronounced. We found this in one third of the patients. And when we wondered what does this mean, then we plotted this curve and superimposed the curve of the circuit. And what you see is that the first part of the inflation, here until 15 centimeters or 16 centimeters of water, is purely the inflation of the circuit. So no air, no gas at all is entering into the lung of this patient. The explanation could be of course that uh, the patient has a complete lung collapse and you need to reach this pressure to reopen the lung. But this does not fit with the clinical observation that if you do a, a CT scan to this patient an x-ray or a CT scan at a pressure of 10, you will see a lot of aeration. So it's not pure lung collapse, it's not possible, it must be airway closure. And in fact we found this phenomenon in, as I say, in approximately one third of the patients. And you see two other examples with uh, some uh, oscillation after the first opening. Uh, which we could discuss as a phenomenon uh, described as avalanche phenomenon of the opening of the airway. And we think this indicates that the airway are completely closed until you reach this airway opening pressure. This airway opening pressure, interestingly, 
is not indicated by an N expiratory occlusion, which is usually done to measure intrinsic PIP, because the, this airway opening pressure is much higher than the intrinsic PIP measured sometime in these patients. Uh, and interestingly, this value of the airway opening pressure is very reproducible, at least doing the measurements over a few hours. You see that starting from 0, the opening pressure is 16, starting from 8, the opening pressure is still 16, and just only when you start above this opening pressure, you, you inflate the lung from the very first uh, time. So, very interesting phenomenon uh, of, of airway closure. Uh, which, again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was observed in one third of the patients, and now we have more patients, this is st still the same proportion. And again, just to show the values, the total PIP of these patients was 8, but the airway opening pressure ranged from 7 to 20. And of course, we, we, never, we did not take into account airway opening pressure, which could be below 5, so we just look at what's above 5 centimeters of water, and you see it can be at pressure up to 20. What's interesting is that if you don't do this PV curve, this is almost impossible to detect on the classical airway pressure and flow curves. You, you don't see it. Uh, very recently, um, uh, Claude Guérin published a results letter in, in the Blue Journal 2 uh, with a series of patients uh, a slightly uh, larger, 64 patients, and at P5, he also looked at the PV curves, and he found again that one third of the patients had this uh, airway uh, uh, reopening pattern on the volume pressure curve, uh, which was associated with expiratory flow limitations, but not, not totally. You see that separating the patient with expiratory flow limitation or no flow limitation there were still some patients here and here, so this phenomenon is not purely explained by, by airflow limitation. Uh, and another interesting observation was, uh, uh, came from uh, imaging the lung, where you see the EIT at different uh, time of the inflation. Uh, so, beginning of the inflation, uh, before the airway opening pressure, and after the airway opening pressure. Uh, and this is the different zones in the lung. And just to confirm that there is zero inflation of the lung before you reach this airway opening pressure. So, the lung is still aerated, but the airways are completely closed. What is the explanation? Well, in fact, we don't know. And that's a very intriguing and interesting phenomenon. Uh, is it the same that what has been described for many years at the closing volume? And this is a very nice classical study uh, uh, done in the 70s where uh, the closing volume was measured with uh, the expired fraction of uh, uh, azot of nitrogen, sorry, after breathing 100% uh, oxygen, and just to show that in normal patients, uh, the uh, closing volume uh, is uh, usually uh, below, above FRC, but you have some patients where, at, when patients are supine, the closing volume is somewhere uh, around FRC. Some patients where even seated, this closing volume is, is uh, um, around FRC and, and a few patients where the closing volume is below FRC even when seated. So is it the same phenomenon or no? Or not? We, we don't know. Uh, it seems that probably it's, uh, it could be related to the air-liquid interface and uh, again we came back to uh, uh, data which uh, compared the pressure volume curves of lung filled with the liquid, uh, as you may see here, uh, filled with air, or filled with uh, saline and air, which could happen in pulmonary edema of any type. And you see that uh, in these experiments, uh, it seems that uh, you need to have both air and saline to generate this phenomenon of uh, airway opening, uh, again, which was not very well described in these papers, but I, which I think is the same phenomenon. 
So it could be the interface, and this interface between air and liquid could well be in the very small airways. Uh, you know this principle of uh, capillaries of different size that you put in a liquid? The smaller is the capillary, the higher will be the height of the liquid in the in this segment of the tube, and the pressure to reopen this uh, part of the tube will be higher for small airway. So it's possible that this happen in small airways in the lung. Uh, what, what could be the consequences? And I think this is why this is interesting. Uh, we could imagine that uh, this is a source of airway and alveolar injury which have been repeatedly described both in autopsy studies and in experimental studies. Um, just two examples, this is an autopsy uh, study which uh, described that there was small airway remodeling in acute respiratory distress syndrome um, and some studies have suggested that uh, this is uh, very frequent in uh, patients having uh, ventilator induced barotrauma like the study the autopsy studies from Jean-Jacques Ruby. The experimental studies and uh, this is the series of studies from uh, the group of Brian Kavanagh have uh, shown that uh, such distal airway injury uh, is not localized solely to atelectatic area but instead generalized in both atelectatic and non-atelectatic lung region. So you could imagine that this uh, airway closure exists everywhere and there is airway injury everywhere but the reopening is only of course in uh, the uh, non-dependent part of the lung. But, but again this is a lot of uh, uh, hypothesis but this would mean that maybe we need to protect this airway by setting PIP uh, to keep the airway open. Another potential important uh, consequence is that if the airways are closed and if the lung is aerated you may have rapidly reabsorption and telectasis uh, depending on the FIO2. This was for instance shown in this uh, experimental study by the group of uh, Curran and Stirner. Uh, it's a complicated slide but if you look at the gas tissue ratio uh, they described airway closure in this uh, uh, animal model and of course the gas tissue ratio change depending on the FiO2 at high FiO2 because of airway closure you have rapidly uh, uh, reabsorption and telectasis which may increase shunt and which may increase the extent of uh, uh, atelectasis. So very brief descri description, but I think uh, we need more work and more understanding of this phenomenon of airway closure, which again we considered significant when higher than five. Uh, it seems to exist in one third of ARDS patients, at least on two series, and we are looking back at our own recordings. Uh, we have values going from five or seven up to 20 centimeters of water. It's probably more frequent in some populations, like obese patients, but we don't have enough data. Uh, interestingly, it's completely undetectable without a low-flow PV curve. It may explain bronchiolar and uh, alveolar injury by repeated stretch of uh, opening and, and closure of this small airway. Uh, it may justify a PIP set at or above the airway opening pressure. And of course, not mentioned on this slide, if it's missed at the bedside, it will make any measurement of driving pressure or compliance erroneous because the airway pressure will not be the alveolar pressure. Thank you very much. <laughs>